Well, welcome back to our study in the book of Colossians. I'm so glad that you've joined with us, and I hope that uh, you're finding this to be not only beneficial, but it's increasing your knowledge and your walk with Christ. Before we begin the, uh, the study today, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Father God, again, we just thank you for the gift of your word and that you've given to us that we can know your will. We can know exactly what you want from us, what you expect from us, what you demand from us. And Father, that's exactly what we want to give you. So we pray as we study your word today that you will show us your truth, that we'll be able to hear your truth, and most importantly, be able to apply your truth. Again, we thank you for the dedicated men and women who are listening. We pray that you bless them in a special way. And Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to serve you as your children, as your disciples, as Christians. May everything we do bring honor and glory to you. For this we pray in your name. Amen. Now, as you remember from last week, Paul was talking about the incomparable Christ as he began in verse 13 and went through verse 26 of chapter 1. Today, we're actually going to begin in verse 20, 28 of chapter 1, and verses 28 and 29 are, serve two purposes. One, they are the closing part of the first previous section, but they're also the introduction to this new section that's going to last until the, through chapter 4, verse 6. And this, this major block of Colossians is dealing with the call to Christian maturity. And we want to look, first of all, for the fact that in this, as we try to mature as Christians, Paul says he's contending for the believer. Read with me beginning in verse 28 of chapter 1 through verse 7, or through verse 6. No, verse 7 of chapter 2. It says, we proclaim him, talking about Christ, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with well wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have, met personally, who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with per persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am present with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. In verse 28, Paul reveals his overriding concerns for Colossians, namely their maturing their maturity in Christ. He wants them to be complete in Christ. Again, look at verse 28. He said, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Uh, your full maturity in Christ consists of discerning true wisdom, which is found in Christ alone, and then living that truth consistently to the end. It's not enough to just have knowledge about God. It's not enough to know what God wants you to do. We also have to then do it. The term mature the or complete, depending on what translation you read, it, it, it gives the connotation of wholeness, of completeness, of realized potential. It suggests an understanding about the basic facts about God and His salvation plan, as well as an ethical lifestyle. Uh, Jesus uses the, word, the term in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, you've got to be able to not only proclaim the message, you've got to live the message. Pro talk about the gospel, but live the gospel. As teenagers like to say, you've got to talk the talk and walk the walk. I put it a little bit more simplified got to make sure your toes and your tongues are pointed in the same direction. Knowledge is good, 
but obedience is better. And that's what God's calling us to do, and that's what Paul was contending. Twice he used an athletic image to stress his fervent efforts on behalf of, of the Colossians and the ones in Laodicea. Uh, he uses the word contend. Uh, that's a term that draws on the rich imagery of the stadium games, of the athletic events. Uh, Paul invites them to compare his diligence in serving the, the church with the discipline and the same thing that athletes had to go through in their training and in their practicing so that they could be able to, to compete for the honor of the tribe or honor of the clan. Paul saying exactly that. He said, I labor. I strive according to his power. I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. That's what Paul is trying to do. Now notice let verses 6 and 7 is summarized in more detail what Paul has in mind in encouraging them to full maturity. Look at, let's read it, verses 6 and 7 again. It says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. You know, we never start, stop growing. We never stop learning. Yeah. We've all gotten to the point in our adult years where we're through with maybe with the formal education that we had to, whether you stopped as a high school graduate or whether you went on to college or graduated or maybe even went to grad school. The formal education is over, but we never stop learning. And we're always putting into practice what God has called us to do. Again, remember, it's not enough to know. We must also obey. So, as we see this foundation must be, has to be, laid in Jesus Christ as Lord. Uh, Paul says, you have received Christ as Lord. The, that verb received is a technical, it, it connotates a technical sense of being a tradition being passed on by a qualified teacher. In proclaiming Jesus as Lord, Paul draws on the church's claim about Christ and enjoins them to gain a better understanding of their faith so that they may live strong and so that they may live with joyful thanksgiving. He said, established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. When we are armed this way, what Paul is saying is that we will be prepared to face down anything that competes against Christianity, whether it be another philosophy or another ideology. That is exactly what the people in Colossae were facing at this time, and Paul is trying to strengthen them and encourage them and remind them they already have everything that they need. So, he goes on to say, I don't want anybody, look in verse 4, I don't want anybody to delude you with pervasive argument. He said, even though I'm absent in body, even though you have never seen my faith, I am with you, and I rejoice with your discipline. I rejoice with the stability of your faith. Folks, let that be said of every one of us as children of God. We are always constantly increasing in our faith. We're constantly increasing in our knowledge. We're constantly striving to be more like Christ. We can do that through the full authority of what Jesus has done for us, in us, and with us. So, he says, as you have received Christ, so walk in Him. Obey Him. Now, he moves on in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 8, to remind us that God is, through Jesus Christ, He is over every power, and He's over every authority. Look at verse 8. Read with me. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men and according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you have been made complete, and He is head over all rule and authority. And in Him you were also circumcised 
with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled our, out the certificate of debt, consisting of the decrees against us, which is hostile to us, and he has taken it out, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Christ." So Paul warns the Colossians in this passage of the potential threat by using a rare verb. He says in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive. This dangerous teaching of the Gentiles. They were, what they were saying was that, that you can adhere, you must adhere to the Jewish law in addition to your faith in Christ. We call them the Judaizers. In other words, what they're saying is you can go ahead and believe in Jesus Christ. You can believe that He died on the cross for your sins. You can accept the, the sacrifice that He made for you. But you also have to keep all the Jewish laws, all the Jewish rituals, all the Jewish festivals. That is a dangerous teaching. They're teaching that that's the only way you can reach full Christian uh, maturity. Uh, now, the good thing is while the Judaizers were advancing around the region, they had not yet infected the, the church community at Colossae. Several other churches in other towns had been infected at this time. But he is he, he's telling them, be on the lookout. Watch out for it. Uh, he's saying this type of philosophy is characterized by human tradition, not based on the wisdom of God. Look at what it says. He said, see to, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God. And we reach, we attain the fullness of God through Him. We don't need Him plus anything else. Whenever you hear somebody today say, Jesus saves, plus, right, you can stop at this thing after that point. Everything is in the, the fullness of God is only realized through Jesus Christ, and we have already retained Him. Uh, even though it's not in this particular section, He refers this to, to this again in verses 20 through 23 in the context of specific piety or purity laws suggesting that the Jewish purity rituals, when applied to Gentiles, actually lead them away from Christ. So, arguing against this philosophy, Paul emphasizes and stresses that the fullness of God is in Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul provides a strong defense for the incarnation of, of that in Jesus' life and death, we see the fullness of God. That fullness of God lives on in the church because Jesus has been raised and is alive and has made the believers alive in Him. Look at what it says in verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. In verse 15, Paul insists that Christ is head over all powers and all authorities. And that's anticipating the later charge that he's going to bring up in verses 18 through 19, that though the philosophy seeks visions as access to God, that pursuit actually takes people away from God. Now, in the verses 11 and 12, Paul is comparing circumcision and baptism. Now, as you well know from having spent any time in Sunday school or reading the Bible, the Old Testament, it was the act of circumcision that all of the Jewish men had to go through to identify them as Jews, as God's selected people. Circumcision is the key identifier for Jews. But for the Christians, for the follower of Christ, it is not the circumcision of the flesh, it is rather the baptism that is, identifies us with Christ. 
This central question becomes then, who makes up the people of God? Who makes up the family of God? Those who are circumcised or those who are baptized in Christ? Paul declares that all people, Jews and Gentile, are made alive and have their sins forgiven only through the person of Jesus Christ. When we accept what Jesus did for us on the cross, when we receive Him as our Savior, when we confess Him as Lord, when we believe that He died on the cross to pay for the, pe the penalty of our sins, and when we believe that He rose from the dead on that third day, and we trust Him and confess Him and receive Him as Savior, Paul is saying then that is the circumcision of the heart. That means we're no longer we're saying the flesh is dead. It's not the physical act of circumcision. It's the spiritual act of circumcision. Therefore, it is our baptism is what identifies us with Christ. Now, let me take a little P.S. in here for just a moment. Even though he doesn't address it here. The act of baptism is something that God told Jesus said all of us should do. Jesus himself was baptized. But the act of baptism has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. You will hear people. Say so you must be baptized to be saved. And they'll also say you must be baptized a certain way in order to be saved. Nothing can be further from the truth. Baptism is just a symbol that you have been saved. You accept Jesus Christ and are saved when you repent and when you believe. Let me illustrate it this way. I wear on my finger a wedding band. Now this wedding band, I didn't marry this wedding band. This wedding band did not make me married. This wedding band I wear when Jamie put it on my hand 45 years ago, and everybody who sees it today sees that it is a symbol that I am married. I am married because I took a vow before God and before witnesses. And God joined us together. The wedding band is just a symbol of that vow. That's exactly what baptism is. It is the symbol that we have identified and surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. So it is the ones who have been baptized who make up the family of God. Now I want you to notice something else in verses 11 through 12. Look at it again. It says, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now I want you to know something very small but very important. Paul wrote that in the past tense. You have, you have been buried with Him. You have been raised up through Him. So this tells us that we have that eternal life now. That's not something that we're striving to get. Because of our, our association with Jesus Christ, because of the fact that we have surrendered ourselves to Jesus and received His atoning work on the cross as the, as the, for the redemption of our sins, we already have it. Eternal life is not something I'm going to get when I die and go to heaven. I have it now. I have the reality of new life in Christ now, today. I have been buried. I have been raised. And thus Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of Him. The power of the resurrection lives in all, including you, through Jesus Christ. Through the cross of Christ, God defeated sin. He disarmed powers, and He gave believers life. Through Christ's death, God canceled the debt and the condemning verdict of sin. In canceling the debt of sin, God rendered him those imp imp impotent, all the powers and all the authorities, and all the other institutions, including Jewish law. All of this was accomplished by the omnipotent God through Jesus Christ. 
That's what verse 14 and 15 say. Having well, let's go back to the middle of verse 13. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So Christ is supreme. Christ is over all. Does that mean we're exempt from following the laws of the nation or the state or the city? No. But it means our allegiance is not to a government, not to a tradition. Our allegiance is not even to a religion. Our allegiance is to Jesus Christ. You know, oftentimes I hear people that are not believers when we present the gospel to them, say, no, I don't want any part of that. I don't believe in organized religion. You realize Jesus didn't believe in it either? It's not about religion. It's all about relationship. And every one of us can have a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ through his work on the cross. He finishes the verse about telling us to reject false teachings. Look at verse 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things are which are mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on the visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be, which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So, having established the forgiven status of the believer and having shown Christ's triumph over all of the powers, authorities, and institutions, Paul warns the Colossians to resist the, the philosophy that philosophy's condemning influence. He highlights the Jewish factors, the Jewish character factors, focusing on the Sabbath, the new moon, the celebrations, the rituals, the food laws, and all the other things. And he says, the admonition in verse 21, the, the, the institutions will say, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Well, that is all human tradition. Uh, that's limited wisdom. I'm old enough to remember that when my grandmother used to always say that the, the Christian never plays cards, never goes to dances, never does. She had a long list of rules that a Christian never does, none of which was based in the Scripture, but was all based to the traditions of the church and the times of the day. Paul, while not claiming that the Jews are legalistic, he he is expressing their status as God's chosen people when they observe the law. So he's not dismissing these practices outright, but he relegates them to secondary status in light of the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. Paul is speaking from an end-time perspective. In Christ, the new age for Jews and Gentiles has begun. The law was part of the old age and as such was a precursor to the reality of Christ. But now Christ has come. The Jewish law was the old covenant. In Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, God Himself is the new covenant. Uh, verse 18, Paul talks about the philosophy's worship of angels. Uh, this phrase probably refers to worship with angels, suggesting that the worshipers are taking up, perhaps in some kind of a static state, into the heavens and worship God there along, along with the angels. Uh, then they describe their visions in detail. Paul's saying such bragging 
further condemns them. Paul labels their behavior as fraudulent. Not only does Paul declare their detailed visions and ascetic fast to fail to bring them close to God, he also condemns them as being disconnected from the head of the body, Jesus Christ. Now, what does all that mean? What that simply means is, if we go through these rituals, and we claim to have these visions, and we claim to have, uh, we have must worship in a specific way, in order to be right with God, and to be superior to those who have not experienced such things, then Paul is saying that we're condemned. Paul is saying that we are not connected to the, to the body, as the body, to the head of God. In our day and age, oftentimes we see this associated with the, with the use of tongues. There are people today who tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, you've never been baptized by the Holy Spirit. There's no such truth like that in the Bible. The Bible does say that, that there is a gift of tongues. The gift of tongues was more prevalent in the days of the first century than it is today. Nowhere does he say, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, he's saying just the opposite. That when you think your gift is more superior than others, you're missing the whole point. Every one of us has been given spiritual gifts. Every one of us has been used, to, or to use these spiritual gifts. But our spiritual gift is to glorify God. Our spiritual gift is meant to bring others to, to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Paul labels all the teachings of these philosophy of this philosophy as being fraudulent. Not only does it say it fails to bring them close to God, but as I said, it also he also says it completely shows that you're disconnected as part of the body from the head. Let me ask you, what body can live with the head cut off? Paul is saying in all this, he has absolutely no patience for such teaching. And so he's enjoining, he's begging, he's pleading, and he's encouraging the Colossians to resist. He said they must be true, they must own their true selves. They have died to this world. They have died to the flesh. And they now live in Jesus Christ. So the world's traditions, the world's expectations, no longer control us because we have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ through baptism based on His atoning work. Therefore, it is Christ, the one who died for us, that we are the one to live for. So at this point, Paul is going to leave the discussion of the philosophy, and after telling us to walk like Christ, he's going to tell us what a life of walking in Christ and a life of obedience looks like. And that's what we're going to pick up beginning next week in chapter 3. So I encourage you to continue to, st to, to study God's Word, continue to read verse uh, chapter 3 as we prepare for our lesson next week. And we'll look forward to seeing what, God, what Paul says, speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit, what a life of obedience looks like. We'll see you then.